Today on Minel Radio, our guest is Minel Cymbals and Minel Stick and Brush artist TJ Hartman. TJ is a great example of a drummer of this day and age. He has made a name for himself primarily through his use of social media. That's really how we as a company found out about him. Fellow Minel Cymbals and Stick and Brush artist Adam Tuminaro brought TJ by the NAM booth one year to introduce him to me and sing his praises. But it was following up after NAM and seeing that TJ had indeed created a name for himself through his own heavy lifting, as far as promo and hustle is concerned, that convinced me. I'm always happy to work with someone who hustles, and TJ hustles hard. TJ has done a great job of balancing two worlds, the nine to five life and the life of a working musician. And he's trying to work his way into making the life of a musician his only job. I really enjoyed my conversation with TJ because it gives us a good look at someone who's intensely passionate about pursuing his goals in a methodical and calculated manner, all while having a clear end game in sight. We all have pursuits we aspire to achieve. Sometimes it's just a matter of taking that first step and putting one foot in front of the other, day after day after day. That's what TJ has done, and that's what he continues to do. And now, on to the podcast. I'd like to welcome everybody into the Minel Radio podcast. Today, we've got Minel Symbols and Minel Stick and Brush artist TJ Hartman here with us. TJ is coming to us live from his house in Miamisburg, Ohio, TJ, thank you so much for being on the podcast, man. Well, what's going on, Chris? Thanks so much for having me. This is a, this is a real pleasure. I'm, I'm glad to be here. Yeah. So I'm glad you're uh, on the podcast. The last time <laughs> that we were hanging out face-to-face was when you were here in Nashville and you were recording mm-hmm. a bunch of the overhead videos for us. Yeah, that's right. That was such a blast. So cool. So if anybody out there is listening and they've seen these overhead videos we do where we show just certain symbol series uh, and there's different colored carpets, TJ is the one with the really – bright blue carpet underneath him. Yes, yes. And he's playing to some really, really cool tracks that he wrote himself, correct? Mm Mm-hmm, yep. Okay, so I think I've asked you this before, but literally there's the high probability that I'm going through early onset dementia here because I forget things all the time. No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) And and that's not to make light of that. It just some days I'm like, why can't I remember this? Uh, Yeah. I think I asked you, what do you write your backing tracks on? Uh, so my main DAW of choice is Logic Pro. Um, that's just what I've used f- over the years. Um, I, when I first got started, I was using a software called Reason by a company called Propellerhead. And they, uh, they eventually branched that software out to a, um, a version called Record. I think it's still out there, or maybe they merged them back into it. It's been so many years since I've used it, but that was when they started allowing you to uh, record audio. So I started recording drums into it. But um, then I migrated over to Logic because I was kind of familiar with GarageBand. Um, you know, 10 or 15 years ago, and then it's just it's been logic ever since. I tried to get into Pro Tools, and I've dabbled in Ableton a little bit, but you know, it, that's like learning a new language for me. And it's like if if I already know this thing, then you know why why overcomplicate it? So it's been logic for me. And what do you write those backing tracks on specifically? Oh man, um, it it really varies. Um, it depends on you know where I get started. So, you know, the, the creative process is kind of a loaded question. (laughs) Um, it could really start anywhere. It could start from a sample that I find on splice, um, or it could be a progression that I come up with and then things just kind of build out from there. But there's a variety of software instruments that I use. Um, I'm into the native instruments, complete control stuff. I'm into the Omnisphere, uh, Keyscape, um, software instruments. And then I've just got a bunch of odds and ends effects and toy plugins and things like that, that um, I'll use to kind of spice things up and add layers and depth and dimension to things. But that's kind of my bread and butter right there. Those, those things that I just mentioned. Now, when you say bread and butter, do you mean that those things help you make money? Um, I, well, I, I, I'm sort of transitioning into that point now where I'm starting to get commissions from people where they're asking me to write tracks and there's compensation behind that. Um, there have been some like corporate sponsorships with some other companies that are like, hey, you know, we'll throw you some, you know, some uh, some bonus cash if you can create some content for us. And usually that'll entail having some original music going on behind that. Uh, but it is something that I'm trying to work more towards into, you know, a, a career of being able to compose and um, kind of freelance some some writing and stuff like that. But mostly for now, it's it's mostly just for me because I enjoy doing it. Um, I don't really have any expectations with it, but I've been doing it long enough now that, you know, some people are starting to kind of pick up on it and it's starting to, 
get a little bit more attention and some more notoriety for me, which is really cool. Um, you know, and, and getting that validation is really rad to kind of keep pushing me back to it and to keep evolving the process. So I'm, I'm very grateful for that. But to answer your question, um, not as much as I would like at the moment, but it is something that I'm, I'm trying to make a move towards. Well, I'm curious. So between uh, everything you do in the midst of this, I guess at the time, for the time being, it would be a side hustle. You're trying to push more into the main hustle. Um, right, right. How much of your time do you find yourself playing actual drums versus programming and mixing? You know, I, I try to really keep a, a balance of it. It's not something that is as consistent as I would like, and that's primarily because of other responsibilities like taking care of the kids and working the full-time job and being there for my wife. Um, you know, thankfully I get to work from home, which is great, but, um, something that I've tried to adopt since this whole work from home lockdown COVID time has started is to make equal time for each thing and try to find balance between, you know, finding time to practice versus time to actually record content versus time to write versus time to mix and edit that content versus time to exercise versus time to, uh, be with my kids and all that stuff. And it kind of ebbs and flows throughout the days, throughout the weeks, but at least that's, you know, kind of where my mind is at, even though the execution part isn't as consistent, like I said, as I wish it would be. Um, but it, yeah, I mean, it, you kind of try to have to pick and choose your battles and find the time when you can. Um, but I will say this though, it, it is one of those things that if it's in really important to you and it really means a lot to you and it's something that you're passionate about, you will find the time. And it's, it's kind of remarkable just how much time there is in a day. And if it, if it really is something that you want to put your time to and get better at, you will find the time for it. So like I said, consistency is something I'm still working on, but you know, I try to give as much time to each thing as I can. What's, what's the aspect within music right now, whether it's writing, programming, mixing, drumming, what is the, the one thing that you're really trying to apply yourself to get better at at the moment? I definitely the, the programming and writing part. Um, that is the, like the new, the new passion for me. You know, I've been drumming for a long time and don't get me wrong. I love the instrument. I love what it represents, what it, you know, has done for me, the impact that it has had on my life, but I'm finding my interests going towards newer things and developing new skill sets. Um, so understanding the creative process, you know, for me and how that's evolving, integrating new pieces of gear, finding um, more, you know, expedient workflows and exploring new sounds. Like it, it's just a whole new facet to the creative process that I've really started to discover in the last maybe three or four years. And I'm finding a lot of like self-fulfillment in that. Um, it, you know, it's, it's reminiscent of when I was in college when I was really exploring the drums and really finding my voice on the instrument. And it's kind of the same kind of feeling where you're exploring that new territory and you're getting that kind of gratification out of the, the creations that you're making. Um, and then having, you know, the community kind of validate some of those things in some of the creations that you're making just helps fuel the fire and push you into the creative process a little bit more. So, you know, that's like 100% where my head's at, you know, especially with this upcoming move to the Nashville area. I, I you know, I want to work with other producers and other songwriters. And, you know, it's, it's a, a very real passion of mine right now. Wow. So I wasn't going to bring that up because I was <laughs> not sure if that was something that I should even speak about. Now, last we time can, we hung we can out. talk about it. Okay. Well, last time we were here and you were here in Nashville and we talked about this, you mentioned that that was something you were looking into. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you and your wife are having discussions about it. So this is official. It's official. Yeah. I mean, I haven't, I'm not, I'm not going to go out and make the announcement just yet because we still have some, some, uh, some big things to kind of figure out just yet, but we, we have a realtor, we, uh, here and down there, we are getting our budget put together and it's, it's going to happen. So should we edit this part out of the show? <laughs> it's, it's totally your call. I mean, okay. honestly, but I, I'm, I'm totally happy to put it out there. It's fine. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now, uh, getting back to what we were just talking about. So I, I understand what you're saying because, I spent most of my life applying myself towards being a drummer. Now, I did it while most of my life also playing in bands. So mm -hmm. I wasn't that guy that just sat at home and worked on technique the whole time. Mm -hmm. Nothing wrong with that. I just 
is I got as much technique as I needed to m- start making music. And mm-hmm. then along the way, as I made music, I amassed some more technique because I knew I, I still needed to get better. But there came a time where I started putting making music, being a part of a, a situation and being the drummer in that situation over the amassing technique and consistently getting better. That's That was just my world. It doesn't mean yeah. it's right or wrong. It's just the way it was. And so drums became kind of this launch pad for me mm-hmm. within a much broader musical world. And it, it eventually led to applying myself towards learning another instrument as well, which became a passion and mm-hmm. still is. And so I get the feeling that drumming kind of was that thing for you. It was that initial launch pad, which got you into the world of music and and it was still there and it'll always be there. And it's the foundation upon which you move. But now you've got this whole other thing going on. So when you're actually writing and you're applying uh, yourself towards writing melodies and harmonies, have you had any formal training in that world? Yeah, I did. I did go to music school um, at Miami here in Oxford. So I did get a bachelor's in music performance. So um, I guess, you know, I, I would consider myself classically trained, even though, um, I didn't really put as much effort into the theory side of (laughs) the degree as I probably should have. Uh, I was more concerned with just playing drums and hanging out with my friends, but I mean, it's college, so you can't blame me. Um, so, I mean, I, there has been a lot of kind of catch up work that I've had to do since then, just kind of retraining my ears and, and all of that good stuff. But, um, you know, to speak to what you just said that there's, there's a lot of validity to that. Um, I had kind of a similar, albeit um, more horrifying experience into the, the, the transition from, you know, putting yourself, you know, dedicating yourself to the instrument instead of dedicating yourself to like the bigger picture of what you're playing, like being in the bands and, um, you know, playing for the song instead of playing for yourself. Um, I was in a, a steel band ensemble at Miami. It was the greatest time in college ever. It's just some of the coolest music, some of the coolest hangs and, and all that stuff. But there was one like guest artist concert that we had where this, like this really awesome pan player, Andy Norell came in and I was obsessed with his, his, um, his, his music, his albums. The, the type of music is called panorama. So it's, it's like, there's this big festival that goes on and this, and the, the tunes that you play are just like marathons. Like it's like a 10 minute tune and it's just nonstop balls out the whole way. And like, I had composed these parts for this song that were so ridiculous, so over the top, so noty and like, a hundred percent for me. And I will never forget this. I showed up to rehearsal. I was so prepared. I was nailing these parts and playing all this crap. And the director like cuts the song in the middle of it and just goes, what the hell are you doing? You are derailing the ensemble. It is not about you. And like, I had this like come to Jesus moment of, oh my God. <laughs> shut up and just play the song like it, it and it, like I still think back to that moment and ever since then it just it was that like you know real world open up your eyes experience of it isn't about me it's about my contribution to everything around me and I've never approached the instrument the same since then like it's always been about serving the material and serving the song and you know not playing to my ego and you know, I, I, as, as horrifying as that experience was, I absolutely needed it to happen. And I hope that most other drummers out there have some sort of similar experience, hopefully not as traumatic (laughs) in public. (laughs) Um, but you know, it's, it's, it was that kick in the ass that I needed to, to really kind of shape and, you know, mature my approach to the instrument. So, um, you know, from there, like, yeah, I, wanted to learn how to play other instruments. I wanted to learn how to explore other sounds and create the whole picture myself. Um, That's, you know, that's kind of the person that I am. If there's a skill set that I can learn, if there's something that I'm interested in, I'm going to try to figure out how to do it myself. Um, So that really kind of fueled the whole journey into writing and wanting to understand soundscapes and sound design and put these pieces of music together. And it was really, really terrible at first. And some some days it still kind of is, but it's starting to, you know, hone itself just like any other skill. The more that you do it, the better you get at it. So, you know, I, I totally, you know, relate to that. Definitely. Well, you get my vote of confidence because I think <laughs> the backing tracks that you've written for the sessions you did with us are outstanding. Thank you, man. 
Yeah, no, I mean, <clears throat> and I'm a pretty harsh critic. Like, <laughs> if you'd come to me with some <laughs> some complete tripe, I would have been like, you know what, dude? No, we're 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 not using this. We're actually well, let's probably, go another route. <laughs> I would have been more diplomatic, probably. Um, yeah. On a good day, but sure. uh, yeah, no, it, it turned out great. Um, cool. Going back just a little bit now, I know that like it was funny when so when we get to the session, and uh, we're getting ready to to do what we're going to do. Um, you were talking to my colleague, Brandon, and uh-huh. he marched in high school yeah. and you marched in high school mm-hmm. and immediately you two nerds got on <laughs> so well. And I was just like, Oh, okay. I'm, I'm stepping out. Um, <laughs> we like can smell our own kind. <laughs> yeah, you, you, exactly. I mean, and I mean nerds in the best possible way. Like I'm a nerd <laughs> about, I'm a nerd about a lot of things. You guys are mm-hmm. just nerds about that. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, I wondered, like, it's such a strong thing that people do, uh, that they go through in marching. Mm-hmm. Um, like, first of all, what inspired you in high school to start marching? And then for those of us out there that have never marched in high school or WGI or DCI, give us somewhat of an idea of what that world is like. Oh, man, where to start? Um, the condensed version. Yeah. Well, all right. I'll see what I can do. Um, so in high school, uh, our marching percussion uh, program was rather unique where we had more of like a, a drum set focused jazz um, instructor and the band itself, we were called the Centerville Jazz Band. So we played big band charts, um, fusion hits, a lot of Tower of Power, um, Chicago. I mean, we we, we just we had a, a very different approach to the the whole BOA uh, association kind of thing, and I think that's what kind of made us unique as a program. But our our drum line was was formatted like really really uniquely, where we had the um, the non free floater drums from the '80s when I was a freshman, and instead of having the you know the traditional quads, we had um, just two drums and a cymbal, and it was like we're we're going to try to b- deconstruct the drum set and put it on the field, if if that makes sense. Um, so right around my sophomore, junior year, we had a guy fresh out of uh, drum corps, a uh, guy by the name of Tim Fairbanks. Tim, if you're listening, what's up? Um, and he came in and basically restructured the the drum line to be a little bit more traditional, a little bit more modern, and got new drums, um, started teaching everybody private lessons. And through kind of sitting down with Tim once a week and his approach to education, his approach to rudimentary percussion, things like that, I'm sorry, rudimental percussion, excuse me, um, it sparked a real passion for me. Um, you know, I'm, I'm very much a hands-on type learner. I learn by ear and I'm one of those guys that when there's something that I'm really interested in, it consumes me like, and until I get to the bottom of the rabbit hole, I'm going to keep digging until I learn as much as I can about it. And that's what marching percussion was for me. I was just so enamored with the things you could play, um, how far you could go with it and the things, you know, you, you could do as a drummer um, with a snare drum on the field. I was just completely in love with it. And as our program evolved throughout my junior and senior year, um, we got better. We started playing more things. We became more competitive. And, you know, I, I finished high school with this really big desire to want to go on to drum corps, to want to keep, you know, playing marching percussion in college and all that stuff. So um, I graduated from Centerville in 2000. And was going to go to school in Toledo. And in Toledo, the drum corps that was up there, sadly they are no more, was the Glassman. And one of our uh, snare techs at at high school uh, marched with the Glassman. So I had an opportunity fresh out of high school to go audition uh, for the drum line that year. Sadly, I didn't didn't make it and ended up marching um, another drum corps out of Columbus called Capital Regiment. So I spent my first summer out of high school marching drum corps and then went up to college in Toledo and uh, did the marching band up there and really kind of continued my study of marching percussion and practiced and practiced and practiced and then went on to march the Glassman in 01, 02, and 03. I played bass drum in 01 and marched snare drum in 02 and 03. And man, like it's it's such a, a big part of your life at that age, like 18, 19, 20, 21, where you're becoming an adult, you're maturing into, you know, the next phase of your adult life. You're learning, you know, so much about how to be a person. And, you know, as, 
as much as it's not the military, it can instill some of the same habits where, you know, to this day, I still, as, as they said, move with a sense of urgency. And uh, there's so much attention to detail in so many of the things that I do, and that's just leftover drum corps shit. I, and I'm finding examples of it all the time in my daily life, and anybody that else out there that has marched can attest to this. It's there's just things that are instilled in you that you will never ever forget. Um, so you know, from a standpoint of an outsider, somebody that's never done the activity or still has the ability to, I strongly implore you to. There is such a great sense of camaraderie, the friendships, the bonds that you make, the the techniques, the things that you learn, the skills that you can develop, the you know the lengths to which you can go with it, um, are are really really great and not something that you can really find anywhere else outside of the activity. Um, indoor drumline is great too. If if you can't march during the school year or if your your school has a program where you can do an indoor drumline, that's great. Centerville had one. I went on to march Rhythm X. Um, and did a, a, a couple of indoor seasons with them and had, you know, some of the best summers and winters of my life doing the activity. And like I said, it's, it's one of those things that it, it instills so many great things in you and helps build so many good habits that it's so far better to do it than to not, if that can make sense. So I, there, I could, I could talk for days ab about it. So I, I hope some of that makes sense and gives you some insight into, you know, what that time meant to me in my life, because it, certainly shaped the drummer I was going to become. And I don't know if I would be the same musician had I not done those, those summers and winters. Yeah, no, that's, that's really good insight. Thank you. And doing an, an entire 180, I remember <laughs> you telling me that you recorded and, and toured with a, a band that was signed. You guys were kind of like an, an alt rock thing uh, called oh, yeah. ne Need More. Yep. <laughs> um, and that was for a while. I think you did that for over five years, maybe. Um, yeah, we um, we started, we, well, we all met each other in, I got 06 or 07, I think, out in California. And I think we made it all the way till about 2012 before we called it quits and kind of moved on and did some other things. But um, yeah, that was like a lifetime ago. <laughs> what did you get out of that? Um, wow, a lot. Um, you know, the to go back to you know, wanting to get into writing and producing and recording. Um, I, the, so many of the things that we were exposed to, um, on the, like the recording and engineering side of, you know, making music was for sure why I got into doing what I'm doing now. Uh, the first record that we cut together was at, uh, Total Access Studios in Redondo Beach. And they, you know, we booked the studio out for the week to cut drums, bass, and guitar. And they, they let us sleep in the studio, which was great. It was so fun to camp out like in the drum room and, you know, on your air mattress or whatever. But now sitting in the control room and listening back to like takes of what we were recording, you know, it was the first time I'd ever heard myself professionally recorded and seeing all the gear and the board and, um, you know, all of the things that they were doing in there was, I, I immediately fell in love at first sight. I, I, that I knew like in that moment that like, I want to learn how to do this. And I remember I, I went into the live room and I, I made a list of all of the mics that they had on the drums. And I was like, all right, well, I, it's like $30,000. So that, that's, that's that, Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. I, I think I can do this. <laughs> uh, and, uh, no, I, you know, the, the whole idea of being in a room with, or on a stage with three or four other guys and you all kind of collectively, collectively understanding what each other is saying through their instrument and being able to predict movements and being able to improv and just kind of vibe off of each other from just a, from a mus musician to a musician standpoint is, you know, one of the greatest feelings that you can have as a player. And, you know, this goes to anybody out there that's in a band or that's played with anybody on stage. Like it, 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 there's just a bond that you make with another human being through your instrument that you can't just by having a conversation or something like that. And, you know, that's the, that, that was one thing that was really hammered home. And, you know, I still keep in touch with those guys and, um, you know, we talk all the time and have worked on stuff since then, you know, sporadically things like that. But, um, you know, that, you know, was more of the positive side of things, um, you know, more, more negatively. And, you know, you kind of have to take the good with the bad, you know, you kind of learn how to, um, 
f- find the people that are worth trusting in life and finding the people that aren't worth trusting in life. And you, you kind of learn how to put stock into the right people and make decisions that are better for yourself sometimes instead of the collective good. And that can be a really hard lesson to learn for anybody that's been in a band that, you know, was going to go do things and then ended up not doing things. So there's a lot to unpack with that. Um, but you know, to kind of broadly answer the question, there were some really great things that I learned from being in that band. And there were also some, some, some terrible life lessons that I learned. Um, and I, I, I'm glad that I went through that because again, just like the, you know, the other experience with the steel band, I wouldn't be the person or player or musician or anything, uh, that I am now had I not experienced those things. Yeah, no, I get that. I mean, it's funny. I, I'm listening to what you're telling me about being in the band and I mean, that's all I did for years. I was in one band that I had moved to Los Angeles with for 10 years. And I, I just literally maybe a month ago left a band that I'd been playing with for the last almost eight years. Wow. And, um, all of it was, I would say on the whole, 90% of it was positive, but, mm-hmm. um, like even the 10% that's negative, I, it, it's it reminds me of the stuff I tell, tell my, my kid. I mean, a mistake or, or what you're calling failure at something, it's just a chance to learn. Oh, absolutely. So, yeah. Now you and I connected, uh, through, you had been reaching out to me and it was Adam Tuminaro that like planted you right in front of me at the NAM show and, and had yeah. us meet face to face. What a and, guy. Yeah. So one great dude puts another great dude in front of me. And, um, really what you brought to the table And what I was really interested in was just how good of a job you do on your social media and, and what kind of content you put out there. And so it made a lot of sense for us to work together. I'm curious, I don't think I've ever asked you what inspired you to start your own social media channels for drumming? Oh, man. Um, Well, I mean, I had socials, you know, uh, even going back to the, the band days, but like, I don't think I fully appreciated how powerful of a tool it actually was. And I had an old Instagram that was just my name, just at TJ Hartman. And, you know, I'd posted stuff on there for a couple of years. And then, you know, sitting in my office at work, you know, working the nine to five, I didn't even have a window (laughs) in my office. It felt like a prison cell. And just, there was just one day where I was just like, you know what, screw it. I'm going to start a brand new Instagram page and I'm going to start posting videos every day. I have a decent DSLR. I have kind of know what I'm doing on how to record drums. So screw it. Let's just go for it. So I started a brand new Instagram page and um, started filming uh, a new video every day. It was just short clips, drums only. And I was just posting drum related photos as well, like stuff in my studio and things like that. And things kind of just took off from there. Um, and I think that is, you know, one of the biggest factors into why the skill set has evolved and not from a place of necessity per se, but from a place of repetition of showing up and going through the, the not, not going through the motions per se. I mean, sometimes it does feel like that, but showing up and, and making something, keep showing up and, you know, putting yourself into the creative process. So by sticking myself into this commitment schedule of, all right, I'm going to post a video every single day. I don't care if it gets a single like or a view or whatever, I'm doing it for me. So I'm going to show up, I'm going to record myself, I'm going to mix it, and I'm going to post it. Now, okay. The, now, hang on. So you said, yeah. it's interesting what you just said. You said, I'm going to do it for me. And I know what you mean by that. However, in a literal sense, you could have just shown up and created every day and not put anything out there for the world to consume. So my question sure. is, what was it about the public aspect of it that appealed to you? I don't know. Maybe it, 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 I, I don't think I would have seen a point if I didn't put it out there to share with people. Got it. Um, makes sense. I mean, yeah, I mean, that's, that's a really good question. Um, because you know, yeah, you're, I mean, you're right. Like I, I could have done exactly the same things, but just not posted anything and still have the archive of everything that I have and kept it all for myself and for my own, uh, you know, study and, you know, taking stock of, the improvements or things that need improving, you know, all that stuff. But I felt like there was a, an elevated level of accountability by making it public where like, if I didn't, if I didn't put that video out for the world to see, I was somehow 
failing at committing to the process, if that makes sense. So it was like that was that was just the last part of you know the 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 creative process that I was committing myself to. Like I'm gonna I'm gonna show up, I'm gonna make the thing, and I'm gonna put it out there. And you know, like I said, I don't I don't I don't I don't care what comes back or if there's any feedback or whatever. I'm doing this just for the sake of committing to doing it. Um, so, you know, from there, you know, going back to talking about Adam, um, he and I started chit chatting back and forth because. Right around when I started that Instagram page, that was when I picked up my first set of Minel Symbols. I got the the Benny Greb pack. And, you know, I was I was on vacation with my wife's family and, you know, I was like, all right, I'm I'm gonna make the switch, I'm gonna commit, and I'm going for it. And that was like my first big like, all right, I really wanna put all of my time and effort outside of all of my daily responsibilities into playing drums and you know, and I think I told you this at Nam all those years ago that like that first pack of minor symbols was like such a like a revitalization, such a like a a refresh to get back into the instrument and to get back into the creative process. Like I was just so inspired by so the the sounds that came from that that one pack of symbols that I wanted to keep adding to the collection and exploring more of the the sound palette that came from Minel. And you know, it had been a good while since I had made that transition and was in the creative process and, you know, posting on the new Instagram page. And I reached out to Adam about, um, you know, possibly working together with Minel. And that's when he and I started really kind of becoming close. And we did a kind of like a trade-off kind of thing where, you know, he's like, why don't you do a loop pack for my Orlando Drummer website? And, you know, we'll kind of cross promote each other and see what we can do about getting you in front of Minel a little bit more. And that was, I think, how our paths crossed. Um, and, you know, I, I, I'm so so grateful for Adam. He's such a great guy. And so many of the connections that I've made on just Instagram alone uh, through him have, have been great. I've made so many great friends. And it, it's just completely wild, uh, the kinds of things that you can do just with social media alone these days and the connections you can make, the friendships you can make, the relationships, all of it. It's, it's, it's bananas. And uh, your main choice of channel was Instagram, correct? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I just I have a hard time getting into Facebook anymore. I, I tried it. Oh, come on, uh, why, dude? All the most decent people in the world are on there. Come on. <laughs> I know it's like the safest place to to do anything. Everybody on there is so sweet. I don't get it. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, it's funny. It's funny you say that because like I had I had a couple of uh, video calls with Ciros. Um, just kind of like picking his brain because his socials are crazy exploded. And, um, you know, he has such a big audience and I was just, you know, just wanted to get some feedback from him. And, and wait, he's for like, people, and sorry to interrupt, but I got to say, for those yeah. who don't know who this is, his name is Ciros Vaziri, S-I-R-O-S-V-A-Z-I-R-I, -I, -I, I think, Vaziri. I think that's right. And yeah. Ciros is from Sweden, and he's got a great Instagram channel and YouTube channel, and uh, he has been running his own drum lesson uh, content operation for years now and does a great job. There's actually a Minel Radio podcast with Ciros that we did a couple years ago, so anybody who wants to know more about him should check it out. Yeah, I mean, everybody should know about him by now. He's 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 that popular, uh, but no, he had some really great insight. Like, don't sleep on Facebook, dude. There's all kinds of groups that you can share your videos to, and you know, he had some really great insight and tips on how to grow a following over there. I just, for whatever reason, man, I just it never took off for me. I never found the the desire or interest to to push into Facebook. Now, YouTube, on the other hand, is a, a, a whole different rabbit hole, and making some longer format content for that platform is something I would love to get into, but that's just, it's just so time consuming that I, I just don't have to film everything and edit it all. And I'm lucky to get a new video out each month, as opposed to these guys that are putting videos up every week. And, you know, I would love to get into it, but it's, it's one of those things that it's just going to have to maybe come once the kids are a little bit older and I've got a little bit more time to myself to, to work on stuff like that. Well, at the risk of really ticking off a lot of people who are purists about YouTube and want to keep the format in its long form sense, mm -hmm. like it originally was intended for, yeah. uh, YouTube has been taking their own shot, their own stab at, at doing the Instagram reels or TikTok thing where they have YouTube shorts. Yeah, the shorts. And, yeah. And so that's that's a, probably a quicker way to get some consumables in front of people. Um, yeah. But uh, again, you you know, you'll run into the people that are like, what? 
screw this, man, come on. And um, <laughs> I, we, we hear it too. We don't hear it so much anymore. Uh, not, granted, you know, we're not doing it like all day, every day, like we do with the long form stuff. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so, okay, no, that, that answers my question. I was curious. It sounds like um, your biggest uh, vehicle is, is Instagram yeah, for sure. For sure, for sure. Uh, now, shifting a little bit, you've worked with a variety of companies as an endorsed artist. Mm-hmm. And again, you've been with us for Symbols for a while, maybe a year, two, two years ago, you signed up with us for, for Sticks. Mm-hmm. Uh, depending how long you've been with these companies, have you seen their perspective shift on your value as an artist that is primarily based in the social media realm rather than the more traditional on tour realm? Man, that's a good question. I was just thinking about that earlier today. Um, I, you know, for the most part, I feel like everybody has kind of shifted to that mindset within the last maybe two to three years, give or take. Um, but gosh, when I signed with Pearl, that was back when I was still in the band. And that was, gosh, I think that was 2011 or 2012. And back then it was, they didn't give a crap about socials. Um, it was more about like, who are you touring with? Who are you playing with? How many times are you on TV? Um, you know, how much exposure are you getting out in the real world? Things like that. But the the power of social media and the power of influence that you know we consume uh, on the content side has really, really taken you know, the, the main stage as far as, you know, getting products in front of people and advertising those products to people, especially in our community. So, you know, there's a lot of, uh, accessory based companies that are signing up guys because they've got large followings and, um, they're getting their products in front of large audiences. And I, I I think it's, it's a a brilliant win-win type of relationship that somebody could build with the company because basically everybody's, you know, winning, everybody's getting something out of it. Um, I think there are some drawbacks to it, but I think for for better or for worse, it's a great time to be a, a creator. It's a great time to be a, a, a you know a, a player. It's a it's a great time to work with companies because there are far more opportunities for guys that aren't famous or guys that aren't out there touring with the biggest band, um, but some guys that you know do have a decent decent following on on socials or know how to market themselves can have some really great opportunities out there. It's, it's, it's a very, very different time. That's for sure. Definitely. Hmm. If someone wanted to start their own social media channel as a drummer, what advice would you give them? Drop any and all expectations and just keep showing up. Um, that's, that's the bare bones. And I've, I've gotten so many DMS from people about that very same question. Like, man, I, I don't have the time, but I really want to do it. I work full time. How do you make the time? Uh, da, 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 da. And it's like, and I, I keep having the same response. Like if you really want to do it and you really want to put yourself into that creative space, then you have to commit to it. Um, I, I basically built it into my daily schedule. Like I would, I have, a, <laughs> there's a video on my YouTube channel called how I make drug videos for Instagram. Um, and I would come home from my lunch break. I had an hour for lunch. I would come home. It's about a 15, 20 minute drive. Come home, come downstairs, turn everything on, play for five minutes or whatever until I have something usable, turn everything off, grab a sandwich, go back to work and finish out the day. And then I would come home, mix and edit the thing and then post it the next day at lunchtime. And that was my schedule for years. And like every single day I was pumping out content because it was built into my schedule. It was part of my every day. And it's, it's, it's really about committing to the creative process. And if it's just something where you're like, you know, I've, I've got, you know, a couple of free minutes this day, I, I'm, you know, sure, sure. I'll set up my phone and film myself playing a, a cover or something like that. Like, you know, that's all fine and good. But like, I, I think the, the real strategy in it is consistency, um, and, and really showing up to the creative process. And I, I feel like I've been saying that a lot, but it, it's, it's, it, it really is that important. And I, like, I really believe that, like if, if you can commit yourself to it and keep showing up and trust the process, like good things will happen. It, it will take some time, but you have to commit to it. Oh, dude. I mean, I know you said that you keep saying this, but I really do think it's probably the most important takeaway from this whole podcast. Definitely. If you can sit down and practice the same thing for 15 minutes every day out of the week versus 
going down to your drum room and practicing on that stuff for four hours in one day out of the week, I'd take the 15 minutes every day. Yeah. Uh, that would, that'd be key. Now, granted, I mean, 15 minutes is not much, but the point is there. And that's that consistency is what mm -hmm. really, really matters. And talking about building it into your day, dude, that's so important. I mean, when I told you that I was learning a new instrument, I mean, that's no secret. I've mentioned it quite a few times in this podcast that I'm infatuated <laughs> with guitar. And right. so I've been learning how to play for some years now. And my schedule is like yours. I've got a family. I've got a full-time job. I yep. don't have time to uh, get up at noon and then play for the next five hours. And um, it's just not there. So like literally, if I like to rise and shine in the morning, you know, I uh -huh. like to get up and not like really have to rush into my day. So that meant I used to get up at six in the morning. And uh -huh. Now I get up at five in the morning so that I can have an hour to practice. I'll drink a cup of coffee, uh, hang out with the cat for a few minutes, and then go uh, play for an hour and work specifically on certain things. And then awesome. in, the, in, in the evening, I make sure that after I've hung out with the family and we've had dinner and we've spent time together and done all that, then I go practice for at least another hour. Yeah. And, uh, and, and even on the days where I can't, because maybe I'm just exhausted or whatever, I'll still go and play. If, if it's 15 minutes or 30 minutes, um, because it's consistency and mm -hmm. finding the time and consistency. And I, I don't mean to turn this on about me, but I just, I, there's so much of what you've said that is really significant for how I've been trying to do things. Sure. Uh, definitely. Yeah. I think it really matters. Well, that like that just brought up like this thing that I read the other day um, that I thought was so profound that like really deserves more attention. And it was a story about a guy who was struggling with weight loss. And he, the only way he could start his weight loss journey or the way he chose to start his weight loss journey was finding a time every day to go to the gym. And he would only be at the gym for five minutes. He would walk in, maybe get through a rep of something get his stuff and walk out. And when you first hear that, you might think like, well, what the hell is that going to do? You're not going to build any strength or any whatever. But he did this for a couple of months on end and then slowly started building more time into his visits to the gym. And what he was working on was practicing the art of showing up and committing himself to going to the gym, not necessarily spending the time of doing the work at first. He worked his way up to it. But the guy ended up losing like over 100 pounds and got into really great shape and all that stuff. But I think there's like a huge message in that about committing yourself to the process. It's like it's it's not so much about doing the work. It's about getting yourself there to do the work. Yeah. You know? Yeah. No, I totally get it. That's awesome. What a, what a cool story about that guy. Good for right? him. Yeah, definitely. You know, I've got one more question for you, man. I, I'm curious. What is your <clears> – <throat> and it can be a hopeful one. It can be like – it can be kind of like as you daydream, but what what's your long game vision for your future as a musician? Oh man, I've spent so much time thinking about that. And like, while I, I don't technically know because I have no idea what is gonna happen in the future, especially with things being you know so up in the air right now, but man, I would love, I would love to get myself in a camp with an artist or a team of artists and tour for a section of the year. Um, spend a section of the year doing session work and rights with people and kind of f floating around different aspects or areas of the industry. Um, you know, I, I feel like there's a lot that I could bring to the table um, as, as an artist. You know, there's, you know, it's not just drums that I could do. There's, you know, a bunch of different things and facets that I'm, I'm interested in and, and I'm becoming more and more proficient at and, having the opportunity to offer those things and to be kind of a utility person for um, a group of people would be amazing. Um, but I think, I think more so than anything else is I really want to surround myself with people that are, are on my level, people that are as f focused and as driven and as, you know, really into their craft. Um, here in Ohio, and, th and this is mostly because I don't get out that much because I'm not saying that there aren't these people here. I just haven't come across as many as I, I wish I would have. Um, and that's like a, a, like a really hopeful thing about the future in, in Nashville that, um, you know, I, I can really kind of build a network of other players and other producers and musicians that um, I really work well with. And, you know, having 
you know, a great circle of people to create with would be amazing. But, um, you know, there's, there, I feel like there's a lot that I have left to do a lot that I have left to offer. And I'm really excited to explore those opportunities and get out of Ohio. (laughs) (laughs) Which you'll always love, by the way, right? Of course, yes. Y- yeah, well, dude, if you come down to Nashville, I'm, I can't guarantee it, but I'm guessing that there would be some uh, coffee and lunch in your future via miles. Oh, um, oh definitely. <laughs> one, just one good reason to come <laughs> down. Come on. I'm here for it. <laughs> yeah. Man, TJ, thank you so much for taking the time to uh, speak with me and, and share all of these uh, great, really great insights with everybody. Um, I of hope course. that every Yeah, I hope everybody that's been listening has enjoyed it as much as I have. And um Again, be sure and check out the videos on, you can just find them on Meinl's uh, YouTube channel. Scroll down in the video section, look for all the blue carpet ones. All and that's, the blue carpet, yep. That's TJ's killer drumming and killer uh, backing <laughs> tracks he's written for us. And you can, if you want, also, here's another shameless plug for TJ and Meinl. <laughs> you can go to MeinlSymbols.com, go to the blog section, click on backing tracks, and you can find any of the backing tracks that TJ has uh, drummed along to on those blue carpet videos. Just the, the name will be there in the video. Find it on the backing track listing. You can download it with and without click, and you can practice along. And there's a lot more, too. Lots of other great tracks as well, not just me. There are, <laughs> indeed. Uh, this was a shameless plug for you, dude. Come on. <laughs> Sorry. But, man, hey, thank you again, TJ. I really appreciate it. Of course. No, thank you. This was, this was a real treat. I'm glad we got to do this. This is awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for listening to Minel Radio. If you liked what you've heard, please remember to subscribe to the podcast so you don't miss an episode. Give us a rating as well on Apple Podcasts, if that's what you're listening to this on. Also, go to MinelSymbols.com or go to MinelStickAndBrush.com or go to both of them and sign up for our email newsletters to keep up with everything that's going on in our Minel world. Thanks. Take care. <laughs>